Well, we already gave them a minute. Good morning and welcome to Waco. Waco is the Water Advisory Committee of Orange County. This is the forum where elected officials from the cities, water district, state legislature, and a crop of the best uh, experts in, wa in the water industry get together to deal with water issues affecting Orange County. I'd like to invite Director Mary Aileen Mathais to lead us on the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, welcome today. We're almost getting to the summer. And uh, we'd like to invite uh, Director Linda Ackerman to give us the status of the Metropolitan Water District. Good morning. Um, I think I'll start this morning with, um, oh, I do want to start with this. We, uh, we at Metropolitan lost one of our um, uh, Gen second in charge general manager, Deborah Mann, has retired from Metropolitan after 31 years. So I know some of you know her well. Um, we'll miss her. Deborah was a, a great asset. She was a really great go to person to answer any questions many of our, uh, many of we directors had, and I know that she's worked with a lot of you. So we will miss her, but she will be off to Hawaii to take care of her elderly father, who she hopes to encourage to move stateside. Um, I'm going to give you just a little update on the um, IRP, which uh, and actually this is a follow-up to the established 2015 IRP. We're working on proposed policy principles. Um, Met sub submitted uh, to us in the form of a white paper policy principles that provided a framework and recommendations for us to uh, dwell on and discuss. The paper was an aggregate of MET uh, board member comments from prior discussions, which began with MET's board retreat, which we may remember we held in April of 2016, uh, which followed the adoption of this 2015 IRP update. The goal um, of the paper was to determine these policy principles that will be needed to implement the IRP itself. This paper provided a framework and the recommendations. I indicated that uh, for future implementation of local resources, resource projects, and conservation development. Uh, the three main themes achieved with these discussions include the role of MET in achieving um, regional, uh, regional reliability, future conservation, and development of local resources through uh, incentive programs. The committee had a robust discussion, as you can imagine. Uh, on the suggested principles. It will be challenging to maintain and develop local resources and conservation development, which we are finding to be a very complex issue at Metropolitan. We're trying to balance regional benefits, um, an important stable base of resources and conservation, all while trying to reach regional water supply reliability. This will, re this will require regional investment and financing of projects. With established board policies that, we're, that we are putting together, um, Metropolitan will be better, be better be able to evaluate and participate in local resource and conservation development that will provide these benefits uh, and ensure proper investment and return on regional dollars that are invested. Um, in June or July, we expect an action item to adopt these policy principle, principles at the IRP committee. These, uh, these directives will then be incorporated um, into MET activities through the board committees that have the jurisdiction over the matters. Uh, I think I mentioned some months ago that we engaged a peer, not our peer. Is peer here today? Where is he? <laughs> there he is. Okay. So we uh, engaged a peer review panel to review the conservation programs at Metropolitan. The team was comprised of two leaders from the Alliance for Water Efficiency, uh, Peter Meyer, 
uh, who uh, has been a consultant for over 20 years. He, he, uh, his experience uh, is in um, evaluating demand management programs. And he, along with a five-member panel, he had another assistant. Uh, and a five-member panel of water conservation pro professionals from Arizona, Nevada, New York City, Cobb County. Does anybody know where that is? Okay. Thank you. I was going to look it up, but I thought I'd ask. Uh, and San Antonio. Uh, the goal of this review was to, to provide a high-level review of METS water conservation programs to date and to offer their opinions, their opinions and recommendations about ways the program might become more effective. The team came up with 11, in no particular order of importance, recommendations for Metropolitan's consideration. These ranged from hiring more staff to evaluating, to evaluate and increase our base conser conservation rate of $195 per acre foot, several more that also involved uh, further expense um, and these, this report, um, uh, uh, then I'll add, the committee, of course, there was much discussion about these 11 uh, suggestions and many questions. The report was presented by our new Conservation and Local Resource Committee, which I spoke about a few months ago, um, and this will be the committee that will deal with this review. Uh, Roger Patterson, who is our Bay Delta go-to guy, was not able to be at the meeting this month. He was in Sacramento. Uh, I assume he was probably talking with someone, perhaps, about the Bay Delta. Uh, a brief report was given instead by Steve Arcawa, who reported that the state has finalized the EIR, but no action can be taken. That is on the CALF water fix. Uh, but no action can be taken until the biops are completed by the federal government. They are scheduled to be finished by June 9th. Uh, then the state and the feds will decide what action to take, hopefully by the end of June. Um, the state water project, in a nutshell, it's flowing very nicely. And uh, believe it or not, we, we, there have been no species salvaged in the last month or so or more. Uh, repairs are moving along at Oroville, and they expect that. That lower part, you may have seen pictures, they demolished that lower half that was all broken, shattered, uh, and they expect that to be completed by October. That would be impressive. I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, now for that ever evasive water fact. Did you know that in 213 BC, after defeating the Romans, Hannibal, who was 34 at the time, and his army stopped to imbibe the waters at Perrier, in the south of France. I'm assuming he also watered down all those elephants. <laughs> and that's my report. Thank you, Linda. I'd like to invite Director Phil Anthony, who will introduce one of our special guests, uh, Director, uh, Executive Director of NWRI, Kevin Hardy. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure this morning to uh, bring to you a new key member of our water community, Mr. Kevin Hardy, just in April was appointed Executive Director of NWRI. NWRI is the National Water Research Institute, which was formed here over 20 years ago by a few water agencies, including mine, and also was sponsored by Joan Irvine Smith. Remember her from the past? We still benefit from uh, money from the Irvine Smith Foundation, and um, we actually have an event which Kevin will mention uh, honoring Joan's mother, the uh, Clark event. They all have different names. It's very mysterious. But anyway, Kevin, uh, believe it or not, graduated from uh, law school, but thank God he does not practice law. He has spent many years as the general manager of the Encino Wastewater Authority in Carlsbad, over 20 years. And he's a, a past president of the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, CASA. And so he really has a great background in wastewater. But remember, wastewater includes regular water. So it's, it's very appropriate. He understands water of all kinds. But I'd like now to ask Kevin to come up and say hello and welcome him as a member of our water community. Kevin Hardy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Begara. 
I appreciate it, Director Anthony. Um, yeah, I appreciate the inter introduction. It's, it's fun to be here. And, uh, not only am I a recovering attorney, but I'm also a recovering San Diegan. So as I've learned, to, as, I've, as I've begun to appreciate the, 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 the beauty of this community, uh, it's been fun to have my wife by my side who uh, grew up over in Mesa Verde. In fact, we've got a big plan for this weekend. We're going to go to the fish fry. And I think everybody else should go to the fish fry as well. I heard it's a great event. And I know that she danced there in 1967. So I'm looking for video. If anybody's got video from 1967 from the fish fry, uh, I would really appreciate it. So I'm looking forward to that this weekend. <laughs> I'll also take a moment here to uh, invite everyone to the Clark Prize event uh, that was mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, the ceremony and the conference that follow will happen on October 19th and 20th. And uh, pleased to pr announce that uh, two things. First, uh, reg registration is open, effective yesterday. So if you'd like to register, uh, now is a good time to do it. You get the early bird registration fee. Uh, but the other thing is I'm really happy to announce that Dr. Charles Haas, who is the best professor of environmental engineering and the head of the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at Drexel University, is the 2017 Clark Prize recipient. He is uh, the father of quantitative microbial risk assessment, which I think many people in this room will understand how impactful uh, that tool has been in terms of protecting public health and moving the field of uh, advanced science and merging risk management with uh, biology uh, in the, the water uh, world. It's been, uh, it was an amazing set of nominees we had this year. They reflected a breadth of impact in the uh, United States and across the world, frankly, in the development of water resources. And it was uh, really difficult to come to this conclusion. But I know the committee that selected Dr. Haas was very impressed with his credentials. And I think that his, his uh, lecture, which will be part of the, the ceremony on the 19th, will be uh, fascinating to hear him talk. Because not only is he an engineer, but he's also this incredible uh, microbiologist. So I think that uh, he, uh, it's, a, it's a lecture that everybody will want to see. We're going to make sure that it's an excellent event. And we'll look forward to seeing there at the Clark Prize event on October 19th and 20th. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're looking forward to at NWI over the next year or so, as I've had a few months now to kind of settle in and, and see what some of the opportunities and challenges are. I'm, I'm frankly uh, blown away by the amount of opportunity, the position that NWI is in because of the investment of Ms. Smith and our member agencies uh, is, is, is one that's pretty enviable, but it's also very difficult. It, it's, it's a question like, hey, where do you spend your resources? Because there are really so many opportunities for us. And so uh, for us to really focus and deliver value to our member agencies will be important over the next year. And this is something that we'll turn to after the Clark Prize event to, to kind of look internally, to do some strategic planning for the organization, uh, for a, and, and develop a vision about where, where it is we want to focus our energy over the next couple of years. In that process, we're going to reach out to stakeholders across uh, the community. We'll start with our member agencies. Uh, we'll work with our staff. We'll reach out to organizations like Waco. Try to get a sense and get a perspective that I don't have right now. So I'll look forward to your input then. And I believe that with that strategic planning, we can really uh, focus the resources that we have where they can have the most impact uh, for our member agencies and for the water community across the state. And I think eventually uh, that will allow us to make the appropriate investments in both our staff and in the organization to deliver those res results. On an external basis, we're going to continue the efforts on our, uh, our independent advisory panels and our white papers. Uh, these have been incredibly successful and are an interesting expression of the public input aspect of de uh, delivering public projects. These expert panels uh, provide uh, the ability for executives who might not understand all the range of technical issues to have a group of folks who are truly experts in their field and who have been selected specifically for the project that they're considering just to, to provide input, to adjust the plans, uh, to deliver additional public health benefit, and to make the appropriate investment for their community. And while we know that the technologies and, and, and the ideas are not necessarily new and, and there's a limited range of them, we also know that every community has specific local problems that have to be addressed in order for appropriate investment to take place in water resources. Uh, these independent advisory panels have been incredibly successful. Um, I'm looking forward to really developing the ideas and maybe broadening them to include uh, some additional practical uh, experience. We're hearing from uh, prospective customers now that 
uh, it's really important that we have a, pers a practical perspective uh, in addition to the kind of academic perspective that has been traditionally a part of the IAP process. So we're really excited about that. We're also really excited about what's going on up in Sacramento with the Department of Water, uh, uh, Department of Water Resources and with the uh, State Board. Uh, there's a number of opportunities uh, for us to continue our work uh, through the expert panel process the, for the, on the EPR regulations has been something that uh, NWRI's executive uh, independent advisory panels have been really active on. Uh, they delivered an incredible report uh, stating last year, as many of you know, stating that uh, DPR is practical, and now we're in the process of developing the regulations. There's uh, six specific research areas we're working on developing the, the, the project descriptions to issue the RFP so this research can start, and we expect to have a role in our partnership with WE and RF and with uh, SWERP and other agencies that have, that have been a part of this process uh, in developing these regulations, and I think that's going to be another area that, that uh, whether it's going to be in terms of facilitating these panels, writing white paper reports. I think it's a big part of NWRI's uh, future. At any rate, we're going to continue to collaborate, we're going to continue to integrate, and we're going to continue to create uh, solutions for the public's benefit. We, you know, what at its core NWRI does is to merge science to merge technology uh, for the public's health and, and, it, and to make sure that we get appropriate investment in water resources across the state, which is not an easy sell sometimes. So uh, one of the things I've been struck with is that as we look across, you know, the history of NWRI, and I've had the opportunity to go back and kind of look in the files from, from many years ago across the work that Dr. Linsky did and what Jeff uh, did uh, prior to me, and it's, it, it struck me that, that that NWRI is really just an extension of the entrepreneurial spirit of this region. You drive around, the energy in this community is uh, very different than the energy that I'm used to in northern San Diego County, which is a little bit more laid back than, than here. But the energy level is just incredible, and you can see it in uh, the, the types of projects that are being undertaken, the leadership that these public agencies in this region have taken. And I think uh, a lot of that is reflected in what NWRI has done and spreading that entrepreneurial spirit and that can-do attitude out to the rest of the state and the country. And we do work across the United States, and we'll continue to do that. So uh, that concludes my comments. I'm going to look forward to working with all of you in our strategic planning process to make sure that we can deliver results that are important and impactful for you and your communities. And uh, I'll any input, reach out any time. Uh, uh, my email address is out there on the website. It's nwri-usa.org uh, uh, or .com. Is it .org or .com? Org, thank you. And uh, I really look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Well, good to know NWRI is back in business with somebody who really knows the job. Well, we have spoken uh, before about the Colorado River as a source of water. We have spoken about the State Water Project also. But the way the State Water Project works, this is an entity of the state. And water districts buy water from the state and pay for the maintenance of the project. We in Southern California receive mostly the water through the Metropolitan Water District, who is a a state water project contractor. There are others, like the San Bernardino Valley Water District. The municipal water district is also a state water project contractor. This entity is, uh, these contractors put together an organization called a state water project contractor, a state water, a state water contractor, I'm sorry. And uh, this is a way that they deal with the state and many issues. We have invited today uh, the current president of that organization, who happens to be also the general manager of San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. It's an engineer, Douglas Hedrick. Doug has been in business for over 25 years, uh, managing uh, cities, water districts, and putting together projects related with different organizations. He is a, an engineer with a master in business administration from the University of Illinois. He also volunteers in something dear to my, my, to, to my heart, which is uh, teaching people how to drill wells and fix pumps, and especially in those disadvantaged countries where they don't have water. So uh, please help me welcome Doug Hedrick. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Good morning, everyone. 
like to start with a little story. Uh, anybody uh, know the show Fixer Upper? You heard, you heard of this? So, any anybody know where I'm going with this? So, um, so my my daughter asked a couple days ago, Dad, you're going to be able to take me to work on on uh, Friday morning? No, I'm going down to a meeting. Well, what's it called? It's called Waco. She goes, Waco? You mean Chip and Joanna Gaines, Waco? I go, no, not quite that, not quite that group. It's a different group. So just to let you know, as far as my daughter's concerned, you're just one level below, you know, the show Fixer Upper. But that was her, that's what she thought Waco was all about. So, again, thank you for uh, asking me to be here today. Um, I, I do want to correct one thing that Jose mentioned. My term as president of the State Water Contractors Association ended at the end of last month. So... Now there is a new president. But I served in that role for a year. I've been on the board now for a total of six years. And the State Water Contractors is made up of 27 of the 29 agencies in the state of California that has signed a contract with the Department of Water Resources for a water supply from the State Water Project. We advocate, of course, up and down the state for uh, issues uh, in support of the State Water Project. And there are many of them. But today, I wanted to speak uh, mainly about our district and how we are related historically to Orange County. And there are some very interesting connections, hopefully, that I, can, that I can make for you. And then I'm going to talk about two of the projects that we're working on uh, jointly with other agencies, including Orange County Interests. So, something fun here. Every organization has a reason for its existence, right? Ours two powerful forces came together back in the 1950s for the creation of our district. The first one is not going to be a surprise to you. Drought, right? Drought really defines water in Southern California. I would say in the entire West, right? It's when we make our innovations is when it's dry. So drought, of course, was a big component of that. So we call this the mother of Valley District. Any idea who the father of Valley District is? Papa Orange County Water District. That's right. Orange County Water District. Any, anybody guess that? Came together. Those two forces came together and cr cr forced the creation of our district. So I want to thank predecessors, Orange County Water District, for doing this or I wouldn't have a job today. So thank you very much. So we were created through drought. Some of it was real. You'll learn. I, hopefully during my talk a little bit of it was political too. Um, and again, some lawsuits that started actually earlier than this, but the one that really precipitated the development of our district was the 1951 lawsuit. And this was against four cities in my service area. And really what Orange County Interest wanted us to do is to purchase Colorado River water. At the time, Orange County Interest were being required to purchase Colorado River water due to the development of water supplies in the upper watershed, and they didn't think that was fair. This was finally settled 10 years later, this lawsuit, and it went all the way to the California Supreme Court. So what was our initial purpose? Join Metropolitan. That was why we were formed. Everybody assumed, form our organization in 1954, the folks would vote and we would become a member of the Metropolitan Water District. And there was lots of uh, pressure to do that. There were actually two elections, total, total of three, but the first two in 1954 and 1958 both failed. Any idea why? That... Yes, money, loss of control was the big one. People didn't really want to give control to big cities in other areas, right? I mean, then that's um, interestingly enough, two of our cities were, were charter members of the Metropolitan Water District, Southern California, in 1928. Both of them withdrew in 1931. I don't really know why, but they did. And back in 1957, as you know, if you were to join the Metropolitan Water District, uh, Southern California today, you are required to pay everything, all the costs going back to the beginning 
of the Metropolitan Water District for your water supply. Back in 1957, 20.1 million was just too much for our residents. So back to the court decision. 1961, huge victory for Orange County interests. And one day, the city of San Bernardino lost 40% of their water supply. So think about that. Just waking up one morning, having the Supreme Court of this state say that 40% of your water supply you do not have access to. Now, the water's still there, right? You are just being told by this judge you don't have access to it. Now, again, the uh, decision came in 61. It wasn't going to go into effect until 64. So they gave the city, these four cities time to uh, accommodate this change. And as you probably know, this isn't the first lawsuit having to do with this. We had the Irvine Decree back in the 30s and 40s. So this was just an, the next one. So what do you think these cities did? They went out like all good water agencies are going to do, and they found supplemental supplies. And, of course, Orange County Water District wasn't very happy with this. There's a lot of fun dialogue going on at this time, and I just want to highlight one really interesting quote that was in the, the newspaper. And uh, so, like Joseph of the biblical era, an Orange County lawyer was among us yesterday, warning of seven years of famine, water famine, that is. But it needn't be, said James Michael, legal counselor for OCWD. If the San Bernardino Valley will take off its rose-colored glasses, it seems to us in Orange County that you in this valley have developed a bad habit of over-optimism. Just another, one of the really fun quotes. We've come way, a long ways from those quotes, by the way. So it wasn't just external forces that were trying to get us to make these decisions to join Metropolitan. There were a lot of internal forces doing the same thing. So much so that we had, inter we had the news, local newspaper, San Marino Sun, had a countdown clock. The number of days until we ran out of water trying to force the votes that were going to hook us up to the California, uh, Colorado River Aqueduct and Metropolitan. And again, was the basin really out of water? No, it wasn't out of water. We were just, some four of our cities had lost access to it. So again, back to this, the drought uh, story. This is our, ba our largest basin, five million acre feet of storage, about a million acre feet of regulatory capacity in the basin. Pretty big. I mean, I don't know the Orange County Basin may be similar to that. But this is how it's moved around in storage. This is the bank account since 1934. And you can see that we're right now we're at historic lows. So the first lawsuit filed in 1951. We had two elections for Metropolitan, 54 and 58. So what, what, what were we to do? Well, of course, since we had rejected joining Metropolitan, we, we, our district was tasked with going out and finding a supplemental water supply. So what did we do? We went out and signed this contract with the state of California. We were actually the second agency to do this out of the 29 for what was called at the time the Feather River Project, which is now called the State Water Project. We signed a 75-year contract for that. Our initial entitlement was 46,000 acre feet per year. We increased that three different times and then ended up with 102,600 acre feet per year of, of uh, state contract entitlement. And the first deliveries were scheduled for 1972 at the time. They actually showed up a little bit earlier than that. So what are we supposed to do in the meantime? So it's 1964 is when the water gets shut off. So 1963, again, Orange County Water District figures out what these four cities are doing. What they're doing is they're acquiring rights to well supplies just outside of their corporate boundaries, not limited by the 1961 court decision. So they were basically taking water out of the same basin, just using different wells to meet their needs. So how do you think Orange County Water District felt about that? They felt so wonderful, they decided to file another lawsuit. And just, and just to add to that, our friends in Western Municipal Water District, Riverside County, had the same feelings about why, is, why are the folks in the San Bernardino Basin area not being required to purchase imported water. 
because Riverside County, just like Orange County, was being required to purchase imported water to supplement their supply. And remember, we're in a 40-year drought here. We're, we're from 20 to 60, 1920 to 1960. It was dry. So, of course, the, there was a request uh, to the court to set up a water master to prorate the supply in wet and dry cycles. And, again, they did... Uh, Riverside County interests were paying $750,000 a year. It doesn't sound like a lot today, but in 1963, I think $750,000 a year was a lot of money. And so uh, Orange County Water District filed suit against everybody upstream of Prado. Any idea how many people that is? 2,500 well owners. Guess, guess what we ended up doing? Countersuing. How many people? 1,500 additional. So we had 4,000 litigants. This is the Water Attorneys Full Employment Act, right? <laughs> and this is just shoveling money. <laughs> so again, was Colorado River going to be the solution for us? I mean, at the time, I, everybody knows this now, but back then they had figured it out too. We didn't even think that at the, at the time we could use Colorado River water in our area because by the time it gets to Orange County, uh, it would be too salty. So perhaps through an exchange was about the only way, but that was not the, that was not the path chosen by our district, right? We, we signed up for the state water contract. So again, 1964, this is just before this doomsday, there was another attempt to join the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And just like the other two, it goes down in defeat. So again, this threat of water rationing, which some, some of it was real, some of it was just political, made up. You know, it's, it's, a, it's probably not a surprise to anybody in this room that even back in the 60s, people used crisis to accomplish things that they might not otherwise be able to accomplish. So... Um, the, f the folks in our area just did not want to join Metropolitan. But he here we had eight years before we were going to have water from the Feather River and what were we going to do. We had Orange County Water District coming up uh, telling us the, our basin's half empty. We had other people, engineers, saying, no, we had plenty of water. We just had to get, get, get access to it. So back to the timeline. We had these two elections. We had another lawsuit in 1963. The third election that failed. We had plenty of people uh, involved in this. And as a matter of fact, it got so bad, my largest customer <laughs> tried to secede. I know you guys think that's a middle finger, but that person... That person only has four fingers. <laughs> All right. There is no middle finger there, okay? <laughs> so the city of San Bernardino actually tried to secede from Valley District. We don't know why. We still can't figure out what that was going to serve, what purpose that was going to serve. But, of course, the water didn't run out as, predict as predicted. There, we were able to find enough water to meet our needs. Um, again, Colton and Redland solved problems by uh, acquiring other rights, which, again, kind of got around the, the court decision of 61. And the water rationing didn't occur. Uh, the dry period continued for, for many years. But here, here's uh, my favorite quote for this entire 15-year process to try to solve this, this problem. Uh, from an attorney, Martin McDonough. And um, it was a fascinating experience watching the experts, lawyers, and hydrologists from San Bernardino and Riverside areas. Remember, we were suing each other also. It wasn't just Orange County. And finally, those of Orange County coalescing around a rational and logical solution to the inner basin concerns that had troubled the area for, for so long. And this really lives to today. This is a great quote. I think you'll see in some of my uh, next slides. This, this has gone on till today. This is really a success story. They sat down and they figured it out. So they called it the settlement to end all settlements. I, I believe it is. Only time will tell. It dismissed 4,000 parties, and the only four that are left, Orange County Water District, Western Municipal Water District, what was known at the time, Chino Basin, 
uh, MWD, now Inland Empire Utilities Agency, and our district. Established, and again, this is all going to be uh, not new to you, of course, uh, a requirement for us to deliver in the upper watershed 42,000 acre feet to Prado Dam. Established a water master committee, two members of which are representatives of Orange County Water District. And our requirement to this entire deal is the 15,000 acre feet at Riverside Narrows. But really what we got is all of the restrictions removed for how much conservation we could do in the upper watershed. So I think everybody knows how this works, but these just show you the compliance points that exist where we have an in, uh, intermediate compliant po client. Oh. Maybe I won't use that. <laughs> Maybe I won't use the uh, the pointer. But right in, right in the middle there, it shows the, the compliance point we have called Riverside Narrows. And then, of course, everybody knows the main compliance point down here at Prado Dam. So our 15,000 acre foot obligation is then join, uh, combined with the obligation of IUA and Western to meet the obligation at Prado Dam of 42,000. And again, in summary, if the entire judgment, 60 pages, can be boiled down into this. Orange County got a certain minimum flow every year, and the upper area got the ability to conserve and use all of the flow of the river within our service areas, as long as we meet our obligations. So we have four, uh, four agencies, five members of the Water Master Committee, and all the findings must be unanimous. Superior Court re retains continuing jurisdictions. We produce annual reports, which many of you have probably seen. Oh, he's got a green pointer. Let's see if this one will work. It doesn't want to show up either. But thank, but thank you. Yeah, it's it's there. It just doesn't want to show up on the screen. Yeah. So, again, we, this is uh, some efforts that we went through last year. We got the Water Master Committee together. There, was, there were a few examples of fractures being established, again, some of the along the old lines. So we got the Water Master Committee together and said, we need to stop this as soon as we can. We, we don't need to go back to the 1960s. And this is some of the, the slides that we put together and we presented around the watershed to show that we really are committed to keeping this together. Mo most of the fractures have been, uh, have been worked through now. Uh, and this is how we're doing it. We're working on a study for river flows. Uh, many of you probably know that we have a multitude of habitat requirements for the Santa Ana River that in some instances, if not most instances, dwarf the water flow obligations we have to Orange County and others. So that's important to know, right? How much of this water is going to stay in the river because we have to protect fish and other riverine type systems. Uh, a project that I'm going to talk, uh, talk about this morning, SARCUP is, a, is one of these cooperative programs. We already ha also have a river-wide habitat conservation plan that we're working on. Orange County Water District is a member of that. And again, the goal would be to try to stop uh, these protests and other comment letters that were being sent in by us about each other's projects. So we took a more intentional uh, viewpoint. Uh, at the same time in 1969, the sister uh, settlement was the settlement between Western Municipal Water District and our, our agency. Uh, similar, it established rights, uh, certain flow up, uh, certain obligations, had a water master committee. Orange, Riverside County interests gained 28% of the overall rights to our basin. And we committed ourselves to ha making water available in perpetuity to meet all of the obligations. And we could do that through two ways. We'd sign a contract with the state of California, number one. And number two, we signed a contract with the city of San Bernardino and the city of Colton for discharges to the river, continuing discharges into the river from their wastewater plants to meet our minimum obligations. And those continue to today. So what was our mission all along? Maximize the basin yields. We're trying to figure out a way to, at the lowest cost possible to get as all of the needs of our uh, residents met. And we build facilities 
to deliver local water and imported water throughout our service area. I have a map here in a minute. And we look for new water sources, including recycled water. And off we go. Charge. So our, our district, uh, 350 square miles, goes from Fontana on the west to and through Yucaipa on the east. County line between San Marino and Riverside County is our southern boundary. And we serve about 700,000 people. We have 13 customers. All of you have seen the, the uh, State Water Project Aqueduct, also known as the California Aqueduct. You know how water gets here. We store it in Lake Oroville and other places in the winter and the spring. We then deliver that water by strategically releasing it in the summer and fall. We pull the water through the delta into our pumps. It ends up in the California Aqueduct, and we deliver it to our customers. We happen to sit on the east branch of the state water project, which is shown here. And this is how state project water gets to us. Of course, it starts in uh, Lake Silverwood and is delivered throughout our service area, both in pipelines we own, pipelines the state of California owns, pipelines that other people own that we just have capacity rights in. And we also show on this map the inland feeder pipeline by Metropolitan, which we are completely interconnected with. So we can move both local water and state project water back and forth into Metropolitan's system. And we have done this in the past. As a matter of fact, you may remember some years ago when the Inland Feeder Project was being developed, there, was, there were some problems with the tunneling through the San Bernardino Mountains. And we were able to, uh, but all of the other system was done. The, the uh, Diamond Valley Lake was complete. All the other systems were run. We were able to uh, interconnect through our pipeline and fill Diamond Valley Lake without using that tunnel simply through some interconnections that we had with Metropolitan. And Metropolitan at the time used that to get through a very, very dry year. So we do have a great relationship with Metropolitan now. You may have heard for 40 years uh, we were in litigation with Metropolitan, probably from the bad blood of the elections back in the 50s and 60s, but that all pretty much ended in uh, 2002, 2003. So our current water supplies come from local precipitation. Some of that we pick up. Uh, as a surf in a surface water treatment plant. Primarily, though, that, that local precipitation falls in the mountains, ends up being recharged in the groundwater basin, and we pump that out. Our customers pump that out. On average, about 25% of our a supply comes from the state water project, and we have a very small amount of recycled water. So, again, if, if we had average year after average year of water supply and water demand, could probably lay two-thirds of the water industry officials off, right? Well, we, we know net average never happens, right? We're here because people want water delivered to their house 365 days a year, not 360. Because if, it, if, the, if, the, if our goal was 360, that would be a pretty easy, pretty easy bar, but it's every day. And it's every day at the end of 20 years of, of drought. So what is... what? What has happened since we cook, hooked up to the State Water Project? This just shows that San Bernardino Basin area um, bar chart that I showed you before, but just as lines. If we were to have, have not connected to the State Water Project, our basin would be over almost 1.2 million deficit right now. As it is, it's a 600,000 deficit, and that's, that's bad enough. But without the State Water Project, it would have been, would have been much uh, much lower. And again, this comes at a cost, as you all know, anybody who buys state project water. Uh, our pricing structure is different. We sell state project water to our customers for $125 an acre foot. However, this, it's the same price as Metropolitan because the other six to $700 is paid for on property taxes. The cost is exactly the same, right? Metropolitan, we, we, we're connected at the same point. So but our, the way they set up our district, the way the people of our district voted us into existence was to say we are going to put on the property tax rolls the state water project costs, which has all sorts of complications. But it's just, it's just the pricing structure we have, which leads to all sorts of other complications when people try to come to us and say, can I get some of that subsidized water, especially if they're in Metropolitan Service District, which doesn't work, by the way, so don't try. Um, so 
of course, everybody knows the, the problems with the state water project uh, reliability. We lost uh, went from about 80 percent reliability to down to uh, it's actually a little bit lower than 62 now. Um, so two two projects that I want to talk about that Valley District is is taking a leadership role in to try to fill that gap. Now we all know about California Water Fix, and we're support very supportive of that, and we hope that it happens. But even if that doesn't happen, we have to be out looking for supplies. And one of those is Sites Reservoir. Who's heard of Sites Reservoir? Again, it's been around since. Anybody want to guess when it first was published? Thirty. I have a guess for 30 years. 1957 is when this first came out. California Water Plan, original California Water Plan. This site was identified in the California Water Plan in 1957. So this this is a, an area in the foothills on the west side of the Sacramento Valley. Uh, I-5 is just off of this photo to the lower right in a little, uh, little town called Williams, California. And the way, the way it works is it, it captures water that falls as rain. This, is, these, this watershed is too low. This watershed is too low to, to have snow. So this is a very flashy watershed. But it's very large. So we can get a lot of water into this reservoir. 1977, there's a water rights application that was submitted that's still valid that we're working with right now. And again... Uh, um, the way that it works, we have two existing irrigation canals, very large capacity, almost 2,000 cubic feet per second each that are not used during the rainy season when we would need them, that have been provided, a given, we've been given access to. We would also be creating a third connection to the Sacramento River directly to the east of the reservoir site. There's two different... Uh, Sizes that have been discussed, a 1.3 million acre foot reservoir and a 1.8. We're really only talking about the 1.8 million acre foot reservoir. Again, we have two different connections from, from the north and one bi-directional connection from the east. Again, we pump this. We have uh, fairly low head lifts to pump up into the reservoir, and then we would also be uh, providing hydroelectric uh, power generation capability after we release the water back into the river. So what are the benefits? This is what everybody should, be, should probably be interested in. And why is Valley District the largest Southern California, Central and Southern California participant in this project? It's because of this. This is a dry year yield project. And everybody knows the value in the state of California of water in a dry year can be ten times that if not 100 times that, of, of its value in a wet year. This shows that in dry years and critical dry years, somewhere between a 200,000 and a half million acre feet of new water supply is deliverable to water customers throughout California. That's what makes this program work with or without California Water Fix, but it's certainly complementary too, because California Water Fix, as you probably know, is a wet year project, right? California Water Fix does not deliver hardly any new water in a dry year, but it, it produces an enormous amount of water in a wet year. So the blue line is the one we've, that I want you to focus on. All this shows is this reservoir is going to fill and be used multiple times over its life, and this is exactly what you want a water supply reservoir to do, right? You want it to fill up and then be available for you during dry years. But it's not just water supply for either farming interests in the Sacramento and Central Valley or urban interests in other areas, there is an enormous benefits from Sites Reservoir for fish species. And the way this works, all these reservoirs in Northern California are interconnected. Some of them physically, some of them contractually. And through the use of Sites Reservoir, that can be filled at certain times, we can store water or back water up in Shasta, Oroville, and other places to the tune of a million acre feet a year. So again, half of that is available for water supply. The other half is available for fish. 
and this is all independent of existing contractual obligations to the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. This is on top of, again, we have to prove to ourselves, especially as a state contractor, the last thing we want to do is invest in a project that all it does is take water supply away from the existing project that we own. So we have to convince ourselves of that. So we have direct benefit. And here's the million acre feet that just shows the difference between no project and alternative C, which is uh, this, uh, uh, the one that we're working on. And again, even in critical years, you can see over on the right-hand side, 800,000 acre feet of water that would not have otherwise been in the system for water supply or for fish is captured. That's why this project's been around so long. You might be wondering, why hasn't anybody built it? Well, you probably know what happened in the 1960s and 70s with the uh, environmental movement and how we, we have had this uh, aversion to dams. So this is getting traction again for two reasons. We had uh, state legislation three years ago that tore this project away from the Department of Water Resources where it had resided for 40 years and gave it to a joint powers authority made up of Northern California water agencies. That's number one. And number two, we had Proposition 1 pass with $2.7 billion available for a project, actually citing this project as one of the examples they want to fund. Now, again, they're not going to fund the water supply part of it. They're only going to fund the public benefit or fish side of it. So again, $2.7 billion is available. Half of it is right now is being offered up to the state of California through the California Water Commission's process, which is underway right now, to allocate that $2.7 billion. And the eligible uh, public benefit, ecosystem improvement, again, mainly fish, water quality improvement, emergency response, et cetera. It's a $4.4 billion project. Everybody wants to know cost per acre foot. So these, these numbers have been refined. The, this is from about six months ago. Uh, right now we're looking at somewhere around, uh, f back then we were looking at $540. This is uh, water north of the delta, so we still have to pay the costs to get it through the state water project, so you can add about $200 to this. But since we've d done this economic analysis, the costs have come down about $100. So we're looking at 450 north of the delta, 650 to 700 south of the delta. Pretty, com pretty uh, comparable to the cost of state uh, water project water. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into this, but this is how the financing works. Again, the blue side is the uh, water supply benefits. The green side is the public benefits. We're at... Uh, offering the state of California the opportunity to purchase 50% of the capacity of this project by paying 50% of the costs. Um, the, the other really interesting uh, part of this project that I think ties in with our relationship with Orange County Water District today is this is an example, uh, one of the very few examples where Northern California water agencies and Southern California water agencies are sitting around the same table building the project together. Not very many times have we, have we, have we been able to do that. And how does the, water get, how does the uh, uh, project cost get repaid? Of course, we have the sale of water. We're going to have pump storage, which is becoming more and more valuable as the state becomes... Um, more uh, has an overabundance of solar and wind energy, right? So you, you probably know that there are certain times of the day now in California where if you're producing electrons, you actually have to pay somebody to take them. We have actually turned the corner where peak pricing from Southern California Edison now is no longer from noon to six, as we've been trained to, to do. It's now from four to nine at night as soon as the sun starts going down. So this allows us to take advantage of some of that, uh, some of that pricing. And again, we, we got in, our board got in at the uh, beginning, 30,000 acre feet of annual yield. That's average annual yield. So some years it'll be 60, some years it'll be zero, but average annual year, yield. 15,000 of that for our own customers and 15,000 of that for the rest of the Santa Ana River watershed. 
And we got in at the beginning. The costs, of course, are low now. We're paying $55 an acre foot. So you can do the math, 30000 We're just, a, just over $1.5 million invested in this now. But as the project progresses and we get closer and closer to the finish line, of course, the cost per acre foot is going to go up to the point where we get to that four or $500 an acre foot cost. So now I want to switch gears and move to the second project that I wanted to talk with you about this morning that you probably already heard of, heard of called SARCUP. Santa Ana River Conservation and Conjunctive Use Project. This project came about from that collaborative effort I mentioned to you before where the water master got together and said, you know, we, we feel like something's, something's splintering here. We need, we need to do something about this. Up pops Prop 84, Integrated Regional Water Management Funds being made available to the Santa Ana River watershed. I was one of several people who were uncomfortable with the way that the previous two rounds of Prop 84 funding were being distributed. Simply because I didn't see that any of that money was going to actually produce water supply. Now they were providing, and I think Orange County received more than one of these grants, as we did we, they were providing a million dollars to a $30 million project. I can assure you that that million dollars made no difference on whether or not that agency was going to build that project. What we wanted to do differently here before we even had SARCUP, we didn't, we didn't even know what it was at the time. We wanted to use this money, and as long as the state of California dis continues to decide to indebt themselves to, to provide this, we might as well do, use it. We wanted to build something big and bold that wouldn't otherwise be built with this money. And that's, that's where SARCUP came from. We have five, five agencies, the same agencies that are members of SOPA, and uh, the five, same agencies that are members of the Watermaster, except Eastern Municipal Water District, which was invited uh, to participate. And again, why did we end up with this storage program, which is essentially just a, a model, implementing a model that's been used throughout California, especially in the Central Valley? for putting wet year water in the ground, pulling it out in dry years, is because we don't know how long droughts are going to last. And if you believe the folks who study tree rings, which is shown here, and maybe you've seen this graphic before, since the developed part of California's history has occurred, we've been in a relative wet period. What do we do if we start seeing 40, 50, 60 year dry periods? we're going to have to capture, be much more efficient at capturing and storing wet year water. Hence, SARCUP. There's three elements in SARCUP. I'm really only going to talk about the last one, but the other two are important. They just happen to be much smaller in scope for this, for this round. We have habitat improvements for Santa Ana Sucker. Some of you have probably heard of that little guy. And, and Arundel removal. We're hoping that with this last bit of funding, and I'd have to ask for confirmation from Orange County Water District on this, that we might be close to getting rid of that, uh, that invasive plant. So we're hoping that this last little bit of funding does that. We also have uh, some additional funding for uh, implementing conservation-based water rates and water use efficient landscaping design. We, the previous round of Prop 84 funding was exclusively used for this, so we didn't spend... A, a lot of money on this round on that. And then the big one, of course, is the uh, put-and-take conjunctive use facilities. So the, uh, another one of the innovative, and I apologize for anybody who had to suffer through this last week at the SAPA OWL conference, but these are the same slides. So um, The innovative part of this is we've taken this system, this groundwater bank system, and we've allocated the benefits and the costs equally to the five partners, no matter where the actual physical facilities exist, including the water. Sounds simple. It's about 70,000 acre feet of dry year yield. Again, basically all we're trying to do is just add to the existing supplies that we have by taking advantage of wet years. SARCUP sits on top of everything else we do. 
It's more uh, an insurance type policies. Therefore, the costs are going to be higher than non-insurance type water. But we have these at least five large groundwater basins that we have access to through our five partners. Now, again, the sizes of these basins and their ability to store water conjunctively is still being analyzed. And, of course, you have to be able to protect and maintain the ability of that basin to meet its own needs first, right? So we're just talking about adding water on top. But what makes this system work is because we have a backbone, primarily owned by Metropolitan Water District, but partly owned by us and by other local agencies, of large regional infrastructure. And we also have connections to external supplies. So either through exchanges or actual connections, physical connections, we can move this water around in such a way that even if an agency, one of the five partners, does not have a connection to the actual groundwater bank, they can get water from it anyway. And we've been working with Metropolitan Water District now for about eight months. We're close on a contract that would allow us to utilize their facilities, again, at a cost, to move this banked water around. This is just a conceptualized version of the model that we developed. The first thing what we're going through now is a master planning effort to make sure that the assumptions we made when we put the grant application together are accurate. And we're again, we're right in the middle of our uh, SARCUP master planning effort. And here's some interesting results. So again, back to what I showed you on Sites Reservoir. What do you want to see in your reservoir project when you analyze it? You want to see water going in, and you want to see water going out. If you fill up your reservoir and never use the water, what's the cost of it per acre foot? It's infinity. infinity, right? I mean, it's, you, you have to put the water to use. So, that, so we wanted to make sure that this water that we're storing actually gets put to use. And, and this is the first set of scenarios that have come out. Each one of the uh, colorful bars there represents the one-fifth or 20% of the capacity owned by each one of the partners. The baseline scenario, which includes uh, uh, the state authorized climate change uh, uh, parameters, shows that this project is very valuable. We, we can fill it up, and we can use it in dry periods exactly the way we want to. Now, of course, if we add California water fix to the mix, the value of this project per perhaps goes down. We're using these results and some refining models, model runs that we're doing right now to determine what size we want this project to be. We had originally thought this project was going to be 500,000 acre feet a year, dry year yield. That's a pretty ambitious goal. We're determining that that's probably bigger than we need to make it. So these are the, these are the results from the modeling so far. Climate change, interestingly enough, has very little impacts on these deliveries, and that's good. So, so whatever happens or doesn't happen, SARCUP still provides benefits. Again, like I said before, California water fix reduces the ultimate size. We think that that, although our original target was about 500,000 acre feet of dry year yield, we're now talking about an upper max of probably 300 and maybe even closer to 250 or even as low as 200. And interestingly enough, what we found is the constraining factor is really going to be the ability of the East Branch Extension of the California Water Project to get water into the basin in a wet year, something we hadn't considered. We thought that was going to be uh, one of the easy parts. So currently, we're developing the environmental documents, preparing the EIRs for all of these different facilities. We're signing uh, contracts with uh, SAPA and each one of our agencies for this uh, $55 million grant and we're doing uh, additional decision support modeling to make sure that we have the right facilities. And again, I just want to thank Orange County Water District for being a great partner on this. They've, they've been together supporting this from the very beginning. Okay, I think that is pretty close. I, I, did, I did also want to mention that I brought copies for those of you who are uh, history buffs there's a little bit more in here. I want to give credit to Orange County Water District. 
I had got the idea for our history book when I saw Orange County Water District's history book. I think they put out 10 or so years ago. And this, so this came together for our 60th anniversary based on that using that as a model. So uh, if you're interested in more of the history, there's obviously more than the 10 minutes that I, that I gave. And I, I hope there's copies for everybody. If not, I have business cards here, and we will mail them out. So let me... Uh, Make sure you get a copy of a okay, business card. Uh, yes. Should the state water contractors provide the L and M for the state water project instead of EWR? Mm. <laughs> yes. And should that be a condition of supporting the Delta? Bay? No. You don't cut off your head to. Yeah. No. 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 So I led the effort for three years to try to. Uh, um, uh, get a contract with the Department of Water Resources to transfer the uh, uh, operations and maintenance of the facilities over to a JPA or some other organization. I was in that leadership role simply because that's what we do. Uh, Valley District is one of only two state contractors that, o that operates and maintains the state water project in our service area. We were trying to take that model and apply it system-wide. At the time, you may remember what we had going on is we had a, a dearth. Uh, we were losing qualified hydroelectric power plant operators of the state project left and right. We had hundreds of open positions. Our system was crumbling, absolutely crumbling, because the state of California did not have a salary schedule to pay people. They had one of the most advanced expensive, which we paid for, apprenticeship programs in the entire world. But what happened as soon as those apprentices got through the program that we spent $150,000 on? They went to work for one of the state contractors. We were our own worst enemy, right? We hired them all because they had all this wonderful experience. So we were able to accomplish what ma most of what we wanted to accomplish with the maintenance problems, state water contract, by convincing the state they needed to pay their people. Right, so that that happened, and now the crisis is really over. Now, would we would we really like to see the state project being maintained and operated by the actual participants in the project? Yes, of course. Could we do it more efficiently? Of course. But there are forces in play here that I learned the hard way over three years that we really couldn't overcome, and many many of them sit in a white building right next to K Street there in uh, in Sacramento. So, good question. I, w I wish we could. I, we, we're, the only attempt we have now is to tr try to pick off little pieces off the co edges of the state water project like we have to try to increase efficiency. Question, uh, right? Yeah, what's the status of site reservoirs? Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, what's the Yeah, yeah. Good, 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 qu good question. Okay. Question is, what's what's up next for Sites Reservoir, and how long is it going to take? So what we're doing right now, and what our $1.5 million investment, by the way, we're one of 27 agencies that have bought capacity in Sites Reservoir. Approximately half of those north of Sacramento and half of those south of Sacramento. And what we're doing right now, where our money is going, is we're developing the application that's going to go in front of the California Water Commission for them to determine how much of the project they're going to buy. At the same time, we're developing the EIR, EIS, and all the other documentations. Remember, this is a federal connection, too, because we have federal contractors involved in this. The parallel process is developing the uh, um, environmental documentation. All of the uh, cost studies are being done. It's a huge, huge effort. How long is it going to take? Ten years, if we're lucky. Yep. Yeah. If we're lucky, ten years. What? What? And, and I would. Uh, it would have been an impossible project had we not had the ability to. I want to use the right term here. Buy off is not the right one. Um, accommodate. Accommodate the environmental interests in this state with public money from Prop One. It's going to be a 
somewhat harder, although not impossible, we're learning, for them to fight a project that provides enormous benefits to the fisheries that they've been screaming about for years. Not impossible, but more difficult. So yes, this is uh, this is a long this is a long long game. Question? I have a question. Oh, here. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. And interestingly enough, one of the one of the biggest advocates of the project who actually speaks in public is the largest property owner in the bottom of that dam. Third or fourth generation farming family in the bottom. In the bottom, in the bo- in the ba- in the basin that's going to be flooded. Yeah. A fascinating story how long these people up there have been thinking about this reservoir. It, it really is. And uh, we're, we're latecomers, right? We, we just joined last year. These folks have been working on this for a decade. Now, they, got, they grabbed control of it through the legislation in 2014. That's when it really took off. But these folks are really, uh, I'm impressed how, how much homework they've done. they got their state senator, their assemblyman, all, all behind this project. So it's really fascinating to see this. Can't guarantee. Can't guarantee that. Okay, we have room for three more questions. Uh, well, one more, I, a little f- ironic story is the uh, the sites reservoir project office is an old abandoned bank building in downtown Williams. It was flooded two months ago when the creek that will be dammed by Sites Reservoir jumped its banks. So we're, we're, we're still without an office. They're working on putting the office back together, but it was just too much. The, 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 the quotes from the local folks was just, were just classic, you know, support Sites, this won't happen again. You know? And this is not a flood control project, by the way. This is a water supply project, but that will be another one of the side benefits of it. Doc, I hear State contractors are going to pay for that, except for the f- uh, the federal part. $247 million has been secured. I don't think that check has actually showed up yet, but that will essentially pay for the emergency response that that, 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 that we went through, DWR went through. But the $500-plus million repair cost for the Oroville spillway, both main spillway and emergency spillway, will be paid for 100% as has, has all costs associated with the state water project been paid by state contractors. Now, again, there's some confusion because there was some separate money that came into the pot back in the 60s, but we, we're paying that back. I mean, we have detractors in the state of California. I know that's probably hard to believe, but the state project has detractors, many of them in Northern California, and they like to make stories up about who pays for what, including who's going to pay for, for this. But there's only one pot of money. That's, that's to, do, to do this repair, and that's us. Once you get past the emergency part that uh, the federal government... What about getting the generation back from the thermal It's already back. It's open? Yep. Not, not, That's the, not the high you know, Oh. But the one down at the lower... I'm not sure about... Oh. Yeah, that's... The, we've, we're, we're a ways away from that one. That went out... No, not that. Not that many. That was one of the examples of what happens when you don't have any, when when you don't have enough uh, uh, power plant operators. In my opinion, things fall through the cracks, and one of our power plants lit on, start on fire. Yeah, yeah. We're still producing power this year. Uh, the, the all-in cost, this is to to me, is less than five. I think since. So it's still a pretty efficient system. That's even with uh, Hyatt going out for a month there when the uh, hillside came down and filled the filled the river. But that's the that power plant's back up and running. I don't want to say that one. I, I studied that one. I was there uh, after it happened. Um, 
Do you know the story? Do you, do you? Okay. Yeah. It was just really a freak thing, you know. It, well, what happened was a suction got created when a, when a valve opened up and water was moving through this pipe, and it actually pulled a steel wall out of its moorings and threw it down. <laughs> so, I mean, these, the forces associated with these vacuums in these pipes where this water is flowing, you know, and these soup, uh, these, that's what happened. So, um, I've looked at the reports. I don't think anybody made a mistake. It was just a freak thing that happened. Nobody was expecting that to happen. And again, what you needed is more air to be delivered to the back of this valve so it wouldn't create this. Yeah. And they, they did now and now of course they're doing that, but <laughs> at the time they didn't they didn't have that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think we lost uh, any hydroelectric power capability on that one. Yeah, for other reasons. Mm-hmm. Whole thing. That's right. It almost flooded. The water up ba- almost backed up and flooded the power plant. Yeah. You mean if the power plant's not working? Right. You can't even get access to it, right? Yeah. Right. Did Metropolitan buy any capacity in site already? So the question is, did Metropolitan buy into sites? So Metropolitan was a little bit late to the game. Um... Although they're in now, they they d- were not uh, in on a Class One water purchase, which has all been allocated. But they are in the process of trying to acquire Class Two water. And class Two water can become Class One water if the state of California chooses to not purchase their full 250,000 acre feet of capacity using Prop One funds. So it's likely that Metropolitan will. Uh, will uh, end up with something. And again, remember, half of the capacity that we purchased, the 15,000 acre feet, well, we're making available to other parties in the Santa River watershed, and one of those would be Metropolitan if they choose to, to participate in that. We're trying to reserve it for SAR Cup or SAR Cup-like programs, but if Metropolitan wants to be a partner on that, I think our board would consider that. The Metropolitan has asked for 50,000 acre feet of capacity. And they're working through that now. I don't think 50,000 acre feet is going to be available, but likely some will be available. Because the California Water Commission is likely to not dedicate $2.2 billion, that's half of the $4.4 billion cost, of their $2.7 billion that's available to one project. Right? They're going to they're gonna divvy this money up. Um, we're, we're assuming they're going to purchase about 25 or 30 percent of the capacity, which, again, op- opens up opportunities for folks like Metropolitan to acquire water supply. Okay, now the last question. Did you think that, is there any probability that they start having a very Yes. So, the, so the, it's the only, it's the only way that SARCUP works for the partners that are MET member agencies or sub-agencies. If we cannot make SARCUP supply extraordinary in the vernacular of Metropolitan Water District, it does not make sense. So the, the agreement that I mentioned is in the works does provide that opportunity for at least half. So Yes. Without again, why would we build a project that that when we bring it online, all it does is reduce the amount of water that met member agencies could get in an allocation year? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Why not just wait for Metropolitan to build something? So, without that extraordinary supply hook, 
I don't think SARCUP works. And that's been a premise from day one. We've, we have to make that we have to make that happen. And and by the way, Metropolitan's been great. I mean, their their rules they have their own family problems, as you know, going on. Those are hypersensitive to these things, but we think we're close. And and again, isn't this extraordinary supply? I mean, when you look at the project, we're acquiring water from somewhere else. And we're storing it in banks that we created that wouldn't otherwise be available. And we're going to bring it to the table in a dry year. Isn't that what extraordinary supply is supposed to be? I think. Maybe Jose can correct me. He's, he, okay, all right. So. Well, thank you. Again. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. Well, meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.